This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We want to teach you about what it's like to be a lawyer. <laughs> we want to explore life in the law, you know. Some people are not going to go to law school. Some people are going to go to law school. They say going to law school is good for you, like, you know, like Castor Royal, I guess. Nobody likes law school, right, Brad? I actually had a great time in law okay, school. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's Brad. And Brooks. they say it's great cross-training for all kinds of other professions besides law, so <laughs> it hasn't turned out too bad for either of us, Jay. It helps you in life in general. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> Brad Coates, and he's the founder and senior partner uh, now of counsel in Coates and Fry, which is right here in this building. It's and it's a firm. It's kind of unique. It's a big firm, relatively speaking, and it's only on matrimonial issues. What an interesting life you must lead, eh? Well, it turned out to be pretty interesting. We wound up being the biggest divorce and family law firm in the state, and uh, and I, you know, one of the actually large of the boutique sort of firms were actually one of the larger ones, and I've run it for I don't know 35 years now. I started out in a bigger firm. They just said, here, you're the new kid on the block. Go do the divorce law. We haven't right, got anybody right, covering right. divorce. So that's how I got into it. It wasn't a real intelligent career choice. Well, you kind of liked it, though, right? And you must like it now. You spend your whole life in it, really. You know, it's one of the few areas of law, when you think about it, where when you start doing it, you're actually in a position to do something useful for people. I mean, so much of law is BS, no offense to other lawyers, but I mean, you know, you, you can spend a lot of time chasing these cases around, you know, paperwork, you know, trying to go to court, cost everybody a fortune. When you, when you become a divorce lawyer, people are coming to you at a really critical juncture in their lives. Well, you know, what do they say? Pain, death, death, divorce. Yeah, I mean, well, and then one, of the, one of the key junctures that's going to pick the road not taken in their lives, and they're trying to get through it. And you can actually, if you're a conscientious divorce lawyer, you can really help them through it. I mean, it doesn't have to just be the meat axe down the middle of dividing up their assets the way most divorce lawyers tend to do. You can learn the psychology and the demographics and the sociology behind the divorce and the impact on the families and where that all goes and impact ultimately on society. So that's what's gotten me more interested when I started writing the book and stuff like that. That's, that's, that's actually been an area that I think we can actually do some good in. Yeah, you can be a healer, actually. Ideally, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, pono, pono kind yeah. of thing, yeah. I mean, it's really remarkable, I, and I've known you for a long time, and I must say, you're a positive, upbeat guy. And, and that that's a kind of stressful occupation, because your clients, at least if you give them a chance, they will make you their, their agent to do damage on the other side. They will make you their warrior, you know, their emissary to visit destruction on the, in an adversarial kind of situation. But you've, you've avoided that. You've... You've maintained decency, which I think is very important for all lawyers to do. Well, Divorce with Decency is the title of my book. It's kind of the mantra for our firm. And actually, you're not doing your, your clients any favor to turn them loose in, an, in a in gladiatorial kind of a deal. It just costs them a ton of money and prolongs the pain and the agony. I mean, you know, most, most lawyers can divide by two, which is most of what divorce law is about. I mean, you're just carving <laughs> people's assets up and bring, you know, breaking them down in half custody and stuff like that gets trickier. But, you know, for, for to prolong these things for these people, you're just not doing anybody any favors. And the court system is so jammed up because what's basically happened in the family court is that society is dumped all the societal problems into the, into the family court, the, the juveniles, the alcohol and drug addictions, the, you know, the spouse abuse, all this stuff is just bleh, uh, in the family court. And, you know, there's thousands of these cases going through every, every year. And, and, you know, the courts actually want to see a firm like ours, I think, get, you know, yeah, get you them and get, and, and get them done. I mean, yeah. you know, you got to get these things handled. Yeah. Of course, the best thing is if they work it out, husband and wife work it out themselves, and try to be decent with each other and, you know, come to terms either to resume a, a, a reasonable matrimonial relationship or to have a reasonable separation. I, I remember uh, one case that I had where they had agreed that their best friend would determine the settlement of the property. Okay, and they sat in a room with him for an hour and he listened to both sides and he said, I've heard you both. This is what I think you ought to do. And they had promised to abide by what he, what he was going to decide. That's novel. And that was the basis for a property settlement agreement. Uh, and they went to court on that and had it, you know, confirmed in court. And that was very civilized. Kind of an early approach to a trusted mediator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably, you know, come up in your, in your time, hasn't it? The idea of mediation, the idea of a kind of very civil divorce where the third party tries to cool things down. Yeah. And he's not a lawyer for either side, although he might be a lawyer professionally. 
um, and he he makes he makes it he makes it civilized. You know. Mediation kind of caught fire in a, the, about the mid '80s, and the family court has tried to incorporate it into its proceedings as much as possible. Uh, they, you know, they sort of there's. There's sort of escape routes where if there's domestic abuse or something like that, it's not safe for the couple to be in the same room, then maybe they, you know, they're not appropriate candidates for mediation. But I, I think almost everybody's an appropriate candidate for mediation. I mean, you know, it's certainly the smarter way to go. Yeah, ideally, it takes forever, and it's very expensive to get a case in front of the family court judges. So yeah, uncontested, uncontested case, that's really expensive. Uncontested cases, just to give you an idea between the difference, I can do, we charge a $500 retainer, same as I've charged for the last 20 years. Now, I can't claim that's all it's going to ever cost, but I mean, that's what, we're pay, that's what it's to start with. And if the clients can fill out the paperwork, talk to intelligently to their spouse, let us coach them along the way, we can get people divorced within, you know, three to four months, relatively cheaply, you know, 1000 bucks, 1500 bucks. Uh, as opposed to a contested case where every attorney is going to want at least a five thousand dollar retainer to start, the fees could go to fifty thousand or seventy five or hundred thousand. Well, I, I remember one. It'll take a couple one, of years one of the to big get done. Firms in town cost almost seven hundred thousand dollars to litigate this case. Went on for years. Ouch. And the really remarkable thing is, at the end of the day, with the seven hundred thousand dollars, there was no money left, and they didn't pay the lawyers. And there was, this, there was a crude justice, an ironic twist of fate there. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I mean, a smart lawyer should try and figure out, you know, how much the clients can afford, how much acrimony you really want to encourage, or better yet, discourage, and move ahead with the case. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science. Yeah. Well, you've probably seen a lot of changes. L let's talk about your book, and then I want to talk about the, the demographics and the changes you've seen, you know, in your 39 years, 39 years of practice. Yeah, yeah I guess. It'll be... What's in the book? Well, I, the, you know... I have a picture of that book. This is about decency, and boy, decency is, is the guide word here for all, all lawyers practicing in all areas. There's everything in this book, and that's not an exaggeration. There, it starts with the institution of marriage and why it's sort of coming apart at the seams in modern day America. You know, it's got tips on how to improve your marriage, how to choose your mate in the first place, why women and men ah. communicate differently. Uh, talks about the women's movement and how the sh what we call the she economy, how you know the fact that women are progressing so far in in, in society and maybe becoming a little more unhappy with their mates <laughs> along the way. Uh, talks about how divorce is going to impact the parties themselves: older women versus younger women, older men versus young, younger men. You know, breaks it down demographically. Talks about how it's going to affect the kids. This guy talks about all the property settlement issues. You know, property settlement, alimony, custody. All it goes right through the drill for all, everything that's going to happen in divorce. It's got war stories. It talks about post marriage, whether to get married. You know, after you, whether to get remarried. Where you know where where the the, the society is headed in general. You know, whether there's going to be any marriage at all in another another couple. Of oh, years. what a great book! I got to look at this. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's pretty comprehensive. Yeah. That's why I've kept writing it. I mean, this is the fifth, fifth edition. edition of this thing. Yeah. Fourth, uh, the first edition, I think, came out in 1998, 1999. I've been writing this damn book for almost 20 years. <laughs> Changing and, it. and it's not like the law has changed all that dramatically along the way. I and mean, there are obviously some major areas where the law has changed. So we didn't have same-sex marriage, you know, back when I started, for example. So now that's a that's a new, it. that's a new chapter, of course. But mainly, it's just it's it's how society has changed. You know, it used to be when you and I grew up. Everybody, you know, everybody was married, right? I mean, you know, that was kind of the deal. The kids grew That's up in intact. Yeah. Kids grew up in intact homes, and you know, and you know, everybody lived happily ever after, supposedly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe it wasn't all that happy, but you know, because the women had lower earning power in those days, a lot of women had to stay in marriages whether they wanted to or not. Yeah. That's all changed. Yeah. So now, you, and then cohabitation. People just live, choosing to live together instead of uh, instead of getting married at all. Uh, the postponing marriage used to be that the, when I got out of college, the, the age for first marriages was 23 for guys, 21 for women. Now it's 29 for guys, 27 uh, for women. Yeah. So all that is a societal shift. And there, you know, it's like I compare it to like the Surgeon's General report on smoking. You know, I mean, we people were smoking. They came back from the war. Everybody was, you know, back a day of smokers in the, you know, the <laughs> 50s. And then we got a Surgeon General report that said, hey, this could be a problem, you know, a few years down the line. Everybody's going to get lung cancer. Well, we're marching ahead with almost no roadmap in this whole social media thing, the impact of pornography. Pornography is skewing relationships weird because guys get these, you know, kind of skewed versions of what, you know, what sexuality ought to be like. Um, so then they go home to their wife and that's, you know, it's out of sync with what they were watching on their smartphone. And, you know, it's just, it's goofy. So all this stuff is changing the nature of relationships. 
you know, s social media and Tinder and there's, you know, this instant, uh, you know, internet dating where you can just pick a new, pick a new date every 10 minutes if you want to. Yeah. You know, that's all brand new. Yeah. So it's really a rapidly shifting sociological and demographic phenomenon that's happening. And we ain't got any, we have any Surgeon General reports saying what's going to happen when, you know, the nuclear family, you know, Whoa. explodes and everybody's, you know, having kids out of wedlock. You know that right now for women... Under, fi under 30, 50% of all the kids in America are being born out of wedlock. And overall, 40% of all the kids in, in America are being born out of wedlock. Now, I, you know, I've, got, you know, I've got tons of friends that have, got, you know, have kids without, without benefit of clergy. Uh, I'm not saying anything against that, but we don't really know where that goes. It goes know? somewhere. It's different. Yeah. Cohabiting relationships, just living together instead of getting married, without that extra glue that society used to have to hold things together. Mm. They, they break up at roughly twice as, as the, the frequency as, as married. You know, you know, you got the social pressure of, you know, everybody's in-laws and everything, keep it, keeping you married whether you want to be or not. And I'm not saying everybody shouldn't be a free agent if they want and spread their own wings, but it's changing. Because now you've got all these relationships breaking up, cohabiting relationships breaking up twice as fast as, as they used to. Half of those relationships have brought kids into their relationship, and now they're breaking it's up even faster. So it's yeah, it's a it's a. But big, isn't it true that people who are in a relationship or married at elderly age tend to live longer? I read. That oh yeah, recently. yeah. I mean, there's no question, but what especially for males. Marriage is a, is a good institution. Oh, for society, marriage is a good institution. I mean, you may, you know, a happy marriage has, uh, you know, been predicted by economists to be worth about 100 grand a year. Um, <laughs> and men who, who remarry, you know, have a woman taking care of them and, and, uh, and a healthier diet and they're needled about smoking or eating potato chips or watching too much TV all afternoon or whatever, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, they, 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 men live definitely much longer. It's, it's healthier for society. The kids grow up in an intact home. That seems to be healthier for society. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why the nuclear family was a good good idea, not just in recent day America, but I mean, for thousands of years, that's been the deal. And now, all of a sudden, we're, we're off on this new experimental program without a real roadmap as to what it's all, where it's all going to lead. Oh, I want to unpack some of that. So, you know, what you're really talking about is the home. I mean, it, it's not even fair to call it matrimonial anymore because matrimonial may not be involved. Yeah, it's right. the home. It's what you do when you go home and rest your head on the pillow. That's that's the life you lead. It's what you eat. It's it's your personal habits, your personal hygiene, sure. your, your personal life, um, and somehow uh, that. That, that is included in being a matrimonial lawyer these days, one way or the other, isn't it true? It turns out that if people are given the choice, if you've got a, if you've got a prosperous society of a first world Western nation, a couple things happen. One, the marriage rate drops. Two, the birth rate drops. You know, right now, Singapore, the Asian Tigers, Korea, they've got the lowest birth rates in, 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 the, wor in the world. Uh, U.S. birth rate is, is low. If it wasn't for immigration, which President Trump may or may not, you know, <laughs> blow apart, um, you know, America wouldn't be refilling the tank. The Japanese are definitely not refilling the tank. Uh, I mean, the Europeans are slow at refilling the tank. Population-wise. Yeah. So people stop having, having as many children. The, that was based on an agrarian economy, economy where you needed a bunch of kids to go out in the field and pull the peaches and help somebody to can them. And, you know, I mean, and, and now... As soon as you get wealthy, you have fewer kids, and, and also you tend to not want to stay married. I mean, it, 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 it's almost like um, if everybody had the perfect world, they'd almost have their own. In fact, the, the, the builders were starting to do this before the 2008 bubble burst. But builders were starting to build American, you know, McMansions. The way they used to, you know, you go to European castles and there's the king's suite over on one end of the castle and the queen's down on the other. And, you know, and it was almost like, you know, they yeah. had their own little enclave. The marriage of convenience. Exactly. <laughs> and that was starting to be the way they were going to construct American houses until they had to, you know, tighten it down a little yeah. bit in the recession. But everybody kind of likes their own space. That, you know, a lot of people don't want to be married at all. I mean, actually, married couples are now in the minority in, in, in American society. It used to be that you know, everybody we knew was married. So right? we have a sea change, a major a, a sea, sea change, change going on. And you're in a great spot to observe that and to write about it. I really must read your book. Uh, when we come back from this break, Brad, I'd like to talk about how this is affecting American life at home right now. And what we can expect, let's, let's speculate together. <laughs> let's make predictions and prognostications about how this is going to affect us, you know, in this Trump administration and for the decades after. 
I'd be so interested in hearing what you have to say. We'll be right back with Brad Coates. Ted Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air systems, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. Well, uh, this is the Cyber Underground. I'm Dave Stevens, and this is a promo for our show. We air here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 1 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. I'll be here usually with Andrew, the security guy, What's up, everybody? and hopefully with Hal, the networking guy. Yeah. And our, our mission here is to uh, make everyone safe uh, with cybersecurity, to tell you what to do, how to configure your stuff, what to look out for, what not to do, what to do. Andrew, what else can we do? There's nothing you can do. You're doomed. <laughs> we also have the Cyber Underground on YouTube. We have a whole challenge uh, channel there at, on YouTube. So just go to the Cyber Underground on YouTube, and you can watch all of our episodes and watch us stutter and stammer through some of the most important topics you can have in your life today. Oh, and stay safe. Stay safe. And then we come back, yeah. I turn it into a whole other career. Okay, we're back. Oh, my God. We have this fabulous new issue we want to cover now that we discussed it in the break, and that is... Princess Cruises, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is it's really interesting what you're talking about. And everybody should know and should think about these things. And they're changing under us. Sea change, no reference to cruise ships. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you think about this and you make sort of uh, prognostications and philosophical evaluations of what's going on in our society, and not only in the U.S., but elsewhere, you have a lot to say. People are interested. They want to know and this is reflected in your cruise ship business. Talk about it. Well, after the book came out, I got a bunch of media coverage for that in the late, the late 90s, and I'd always loved to travel. I've traveled all around the world for years, and, and I convinced Princess Cruises that I was the guy to talk about some of these societal changes and global changes, uh, not just within a family, but how that was going to have some ripple effects. And, you know, I was getting older, so I could talk about retirement planning as an attorney. You know, you got to sort of broaden your shtick a little bit, but I, I managed to, you know, lecture for them for 15, 16 years, <laughs> taking two or three cruises a year. People were fascinated. All over, over everywhere. Everywhere yeah. and uh, and uh, it, it, it wound up great. I got to like 130, 140 countries all for free, courtesy of Princess yeah. Cruises. Yeah, but I mean, you have the ability to look not only in the dark side because you you know if you're practicing law, you have to be ready to do battle if necessary. Uh, there, you know, not everybody is in the same level of decency, frankly. Um, but also, uh, you know, you, you can help people, as you said before. You can provide them with positive input and suggestions about how to live a better life at home in marriage. This is extremely valuable, and it's not not a psychologist necessarily, or a, a psychiatrist, or anything like, or a marriage counselor. No, it's sort of life counseling based on your own experience. I think it's great. I've had a lot of clients tell me that you know that I've been more valuable to them than going to see a marriage counselor. Yeah. You know, I've probably done more divorces than most marriage counselors yeah. or any marriage yeah, counselor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done thousands of these. It's things. It's not clinical. You're kind of you're a lawyer in practice. You know what's happening in the community. You have your own database, so to speak. Not necessarily so with a marriage counselor. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a really interesting profession, and uh, and I've enjoyed it. And I think it's one area of law, like I say, where I think you can actually do some good for people. So it's it's worked out well. Yeah, you know, there's a you've heard, I'm sure, in most of your audience heard of the 80-20 rule, um, where you know you get in our case, we probably we probably settle 80 percent of the cases that come through. And it generates probably 20% of our revenue, and the 20% that won't rev that won't settle and have to go to court probably it's generates 80% of the revenue. And that applies as, as it should be, actually. Yeah. I think. You know. So um, you know, I think you're doing your clients more of a favor if you can get them on a on a settlement track. So why do I think that the 80-20 rule is not necessarily what was happening in the 70s or the 80s? No, no. Uh, that you have seen these things, you know, affect the practice. So can you talk about the, um, you know, the way the practice has changed in this area over those years? Well, the uh, you know the actual nuts and bolts of, of you know Hawaii divorce law can be broken down into a few few areas. I mean, you've obviously got the property settlements, you got potentially alimony. Although you know Hawaii is not a very strong alimony state, we only award alimony less than nine percent of all is cases. Is that right? This ain't the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills where you get alimony for life. You know, that's because all the women work in Hawaii. That's, everybody's right? got to be two income couples just to stay yeah. alive. And yeah, 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 yeah. And then you got child custody. 
So, you know, there's there's some areas like that that you know that you've got to understand. There's tax consequences. Everybody's you know, everybody's home and is their capital changed. in Hawaii. So that's that's huge. Yeah, under the new Trump thing, it just came out today. They're going to take away the tax deductibility of alimony, or they're proposing to. So that's a major change. But the the single biggest change of all has been in the custody area. It used to be when I first started custody, started uh, uh, practicing law here, in the late 70s. I would. I tried. To, I remember trying to take a joint custody, joint physical custody agreement in, in front of an, an old style judge, and he said, yeah, "This will never work. They can't share custody. You got to give the kid to one or the other. Come on." And then over the years, they've done follow up studies with the children of divorce that say that, the, the, and they go back and contact these kids. What was the toughest thing about your parents' divorce? And they always say, "Well, the hardest thing was being separated from either parent." So that led, you know, the touchy-feely Marin County therapists in California started, well, then we ought to all have joint custody so they can continue to see, you know, both the parents all the time. So joint physical custody is now kind of the law of the land. Mm. And as I was mentioning to you earlier, that kind of gets, you know, forced down your throat. I mean, you got to still be living in the same state. I mean, if people are going to relocate away from Hawaii, it's a hard time to have, it's hard to have joint custody. But if, you're, if it's possible, the courts will push you towards joint custody. So that now has spawned some unintended consequences because one of the only ways you can, uh, uh, somebody who wants sole custody can get out from underneath having joint custody shoved down their throat is to make some allegations about either drug abuse, alcohol abuse, oh, or, or domestic abuse. Oh. So now the TRO calendar, the temporary restraining order calendar, where people are claiming you know, abuse has gone through the roof. And that has become almost as busy a calendar or busier calendar than the, the divorce calendar. Yeah. I, you know, I've literally had to hire former prosecutors, former public defenders, because it's almost quasi-criminalized. It's the criminalization of the divorce practice, yeah. no? Yeah. So that's probably one of the, the, the major in, uh, things that has changed. It's really too bad to have to do your laundry that way. Well, it's expensive, and, 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 it's, and it really, I mean, it's really hard to have divorce with decency after you, you build swear out these the affidavits for your accusing. scars on the children. Sure. You know, it's, it's and you've got to swear out these affidavits that accuse the other side of everything under the sun. I mean, yeah, it's, you yeah, know, it's yeah. ugly. But some of it is true. I mean, some of, the, yeah. some of this abuse is true. And it's well, you had that ICAO oh. case. I, the media interviewed me on that ICAO case where the guy stabbed his son and then hung himself. Or Yeah. Oh, gosh. You know, it was horrible. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's nothing to be made light of. So much it, of that. So much of family abuse and yeah. spousal abuse. And I wonder, uh, is your sense of it, Brad, that this is getting worse and that in a complex society where, you know, people can't make enough money to have a comfortable middle class life, in Hawaii, um, that the family breaks down, that the family is, has more violence, more abuse. Um, am I right to say there's a trend in that direction? Well, I, you know, I think that's probably an accurate observation. I mean, anytime you get, you know, the opioid ep epidemic or something sure. like that, that is happening, you know, I mean, people do weird stuff when they're under the influence of drugs, and, and people take to drugs when they're really, they got no, no, nothing positive going on in their life. I mean, that, you know, that's what you know, that's what you hear the concerns about them. You know, the disappearing middle class, and then these these people have got no hope. They start taking all these drugs that are so easily available. So, I mean, I'm sure that's a problem. I, you know, obviously, if you got people that are you know that are you know on the verge of homelessness, that puts uh, economic pressure sure. on. Uh, Ooh. You know, imagine I mean, homelessness and, and and matrimonial issues. Well, that must be so complicated. Well, when I give talks about you know. People always ask me, what are the main causes of divorce? And I usually talk about, you know, four of them. One is, you know, sex, either, you know, not enough inside the marriage or too much outside of the marriage. <laughs> Money, it's what we're talking about, either too much or too, you know, if, if, if there's too little, it puts real pressure on the, on the checkbook. If, if, there, if people get too wealthy, they get a little cocky and start going a little crazy sometimes. Um, family. You know, it can be anything from meddling in-laws to uh, dis different parenting styles, different parent ideas as to how to raise the kids. Um, and then the, the fourth one is this thing that women are much more serious about and we're not, as guys, all that good at, which is communication. Yeah, between and, the spouses. And women want more communication out of their guys. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating statistic that women have something like 20,000 uh, body language, what they call communication signals, either verbally or you know, lifting their eyebrows or shrugging their shoulders or you know, cross eyes. You know. And guys <laughs> have like a third of that, about 7,000. That's what John Gray writes in his Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus book. And you know, women are not happy with, with guys. So what should men do to avoid this? Well, they better communicate or their wives are going to divorce them. I mean, two thirds of all the divorces in both in Hawaii. They come into you and say he's not communicating with me. Yeah. Um, you know, Guys are, guys are born to compete 
not to connect necessarily. Isn't that true? You know, you think about it, you know, a guy grows up, he, you know, it's competing on sports teams, it's locker room talk, you know, you, you go to law school, you come out, you want to, you got to be a junior partner, and then you got to be a senior partner, you're competing all the way at the corporate level. Donald Trump knows about this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and women are, you know, much more into connecting. Yeah. And, so, and so they are not satisfied sometimes when the guys are just come home and, you know, drink a, you know, martini and put in their lazy boy lounger and just turn on the sports channel and, they, you know, that, and, and women are going, you know, but, you know, don't you understand? I it's have this classical, thing. you know, yeah. the beer and the potato chips and the, exactly. the football game. Exactly. Oh, said, exactly. Don't talk to me. I got to watch. So in the larger sense, though, and I know you've been thinking about this and I must read your book to find out more about it, but I'd like to talk about the grand sea changes, the, the sea changes to society. You know, we have polarization of wealth, we have social polarization, we have racial, what do you want to call it, uh, racial stress and strain these days in this country, maybe being exacerbated under this administration. Uh, we have people who are really unhappy. And, um, and we, have, we have, as you said, marriage is maybe a declining institution. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, logically, marriage is what keeps things stable for a lot of people. Uh, where is it all going? Can you talk to me about that? Well, from the from the standpoint of marriages, the the biggest problem that I see on the horizon has been on the horizon for quite some time now. In fact, you wouldn't have Think Tech if it wasn't for social media and all the you know all the impact that the internet has had. And again, and all the, when you think about the impact of the internet has been for marriage, it's incredible for relationships in general. I mean, it used to be that the two pillars of a relationship, of meeting somebody and starting a relationship, had to be proximity and timing. You had to actually go physically meet somebody. You know, all those marriages that came out of the, you know, the, the in a wedding, you know, the best man marries the maid of honor. You know, they, you know, they meet each other's friends. Familiarity. Yeah. You know, exactly. Or, you know, somebody that you went to college with. I mean, you actually knew who they were and had met them physically. So proximity and timing. Timing had to be right. It didn't do any good if the best man was married and the, and the, and the, and the maid of honor was, you know, was, was single, then that wasn't going to fly. <laughs> so... You had to have people be ready for the relationship at their right time in life, and you had to actually meet them. Well, when you think about what the Internet's done, it's broken down both of those two barriers. Yeah. Proximity is basically worldwide. I mean, yeah, you know, you, yeah. can, you can go online and meet a girl from Croatia tomorrow. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And the, and the timing is instantaneous. You can have a date with somebody at you know six o'clock dinner date, and it's not panning out. You drop her off at you know nine o'clock. You you know you you, know, you text somebody it's else. The biggest and, black book in the world. Yeah, <laughs> and all these dating sites and stuff. So what that has done is it's worked in favor of shorter term revolving relationships because there's this you know huge dating pool of, of conceivable linkages. So the old style. Of you know, if I don't marry him or her, I'll never find anybody as wonderful. You know, you're from a small town in Nebraska, and you know this is the only guy I'm ever going to meet in my life. I better go ahead and marry him. He may not be perfect, that's but that's over. That's over. Yeah. So so now there's all this short-term thinking on on everything basically, and it's and it's and it applies to relationships. So now you have you have no there, there's no glue to hold any of this stuff yeah, so together. So on a macro basis, this is not necessarily a good thing. On a national or international basis, on a social structure basis, not such a good thing. Well, I don't want to come on a tech show and be, be dissing tech, but I mean, you know, it is, it's, you know, it, it has, it's going to have ramifications. I'm not even going to say whether they're going to be good or bad, but I yeah. mean, it's going to totally change it. Yeah. Now you can basically do whatever you want with whoever you want, and you know, if that doesn't work out, you go do something else with somebody else, and yeah. you can do it. I mean, they've got these websites yeah. now that are based on the GPS, and you know, you live in New York, you know, you can you can find out who's a couple of blocks away, you can find out literally who's within two hundred yards, and you know, yeah. and you can say, okay, let's meet yeah, at Joe's scary. bar. Now, how is this going to affect the practice? How is it going to affect your firm, Coates and Fry, going forward? Well, there have been a couple of things. I mean, I, I run a good sized firm. It's the biggest firm in Hawaii. We got eleven lawyers. Where you know, it's, it's you got a huge overhead. We got you know, we got to pay attention to the business model, and that's kind of what I'm you know, when I founded the firm, and I'm kind of good. Got to look it. ahead. Yeah, look at all those people. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we've had to restructure the firm. The, you know, if divorce is not going to be as common, because marriage, you know, it's not like people, it's not like the divorce rate is going down. The divorce rate pretty, has stayed pretty stable. 
which interestingly, everybody thinks in terms of you know, half of all marriages ending in divorce. It's actually about 40 to 45 percent of first marriages ending in divorce, about 60 to 65 percent of second marriages ending in divorce, and fully 75 to 85 percent of third marriages ending in wow, divorce. Wow, it's harder each time. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> by that time they got the divorce lawyer's <laughs> cell phone programmed into your speed So you'll be more busy going forward with this fluid in and out well, matrimonial sex. Except for they may or not be getting married. I mean, a lot yeah. of these people choose to cohabit instead. Yeah. But what they don't do is they don't stop having sex. Yeah. So the paternity calendar is a huge one because, you know, the, the society, again, dumps all its problems in yeah. family court. It's not just marriages. All these, all these kids that have been born out of wedlock, you got to figure out what to do if, if the couple sure. splits up. You got to figure abuse, out what to do with custody. Other uh, things at home. What about palimony? Is that is, is there is there palimony in Hawaii? Do you there think is no there'll be more of it? Hawaii. You think it'll happen even in the absence of marriage? Well, uh, I, you know, I don't see any uh, legislative changes to bring palimony to uh, to Hawaii. Um, which is interesting because, you know, some states, I'm not sure, but I think Colorado has like seven years you live together, the state deems you be married. Yeah. I had dinner with a, with a lady lawyer from Vancouver, Canada. She said that after one year, the courts will get in and start trying to monkey around with the body of property. But in Hawaii, you know, you can live together forever, and unless you've gotten married, um, you've got, you know, you go to circuit court, like if a couple buys a house together, you got to go to circuit court to unravel it. Yeah, um, yeah. So, it's, not, it's not a divorce So case. no, pal no palimony, else. which is fortunate for guys like me who used to live with yeah. way too many yeah. women before I got married. Who knows? There's something to watch, though. Because <laughs> it, it, may yeah. be, it may be going up, Could it may change. be going down. Could who change. knows? That, that, that's the jury's so, out on that. So it's, but, the, but the paternity calendar where people still are having kids, you still got to decide custody and child support. We've beefed up our, our emphasis on that. And then the other area, of course, is this uh, this TRO domestic abuse thing that's that's yeah, going on. She's probably going to have to work harder on that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're almost out of time, but Brad, I'd like you to pick a paragraph in your book and let people have the the feel of it, and uh, then maybe they'll check it out on, I guess, Amazon. Huh? I, uh, yeah, it's on Amazon. UH Press put it out. This has to do with uh, the impact of pornography on modern. Oh, ah, interesting. That's what we were talking about. So, <laughs> so I was saying here. Um, the uh, doesn't take a genius to realize that the more you can have sex literally, quote, handed to you exactly the way you like it, the more the, quote, real thing is likely to suffer by comparison. Now that anybody with a smartphone can order up personally customized, including extreme or perverted sexual desires, as delivered by pumped up professionals, aided by silicon steroids and sexual skill sets beyond the capabilities of m most mere mortals, how long does it take before the fantasy fetishes replace and dramatically diminish real human relationships? <laughs> it appears that porn is literally rewiring the brains and bodies of many, its, many of its aficionado, aficionados. So, so you, know, you know, in terms of writing style, you write just the way you talk. Yeah. You're, you're unified talking, writing, it's all the same. Thank you so much, Brad. Great yeah. discussion. I, I, I hope we can continue this on other I'm issues available. going forward. I'm only Brad Coates, Coates and Fry, matrimonial lawyer for 39 years. Thanks so much. And counting. <laughs> Thanks, Jay.